I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, uh, Professor Dimitris Kontouras. He's a, he's a leader in the, in the field of iron overload and liver affection. He will speak to us about iron removal, the liver versus the heart. Good morning, Mr. President. And I'd like to thank the organizing committee to invite me here to give this talk. And uh, I feel very nice that I'm back in a country that I, I really love. Uh, there's a very long debate uh, about what to do first, to look after uh, the liver iron or the iron of the heart. These are my disclosures. So we have a few topics, a few uh, specific topics to, to clarify before we decide if this is a true dilemma or not. My first key point to develop is which is the main pattern of iron deposition in the human body in thalassemia. We clearly know that iron overload is caused by transfusions and ineffective erythropoiesis. We also know that liver iron is the, 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 the major burden of iron the biggest part, the largest past part of, uh, of load, of viral load in the body. And this is the way that iron aggregates with no or inadequate treatment, chelation treatment, and the way that it goes, it goes down, and what is the relation between the liver iron concentration and the heart iron concentration. We can notice that first iron of the liver raises, and then when effective treatment is introduced, also the heart follows, if not goes ahead to this road. We need uh, different measurements for calculating the iron burden. And the most common is ferritin, but ferritin trends not to predict changes in total body iron patients with transfusional iron overload. Despite that, ferritin is uh, the most cheap and uh, reliable when you use this, uh, this test uh, adapted, adopted to each one patient and have his own uh, diary of changes. Excess of iron is not only uh, it's not only a title. There are a lot of uh, specifications, a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, places and uh, clusters inside the, uh, the human physiology where it can be found. It is of course found in the plasma uh, with ferritin transferring, and uh, it is also circulating as uh, LPI, as labile plasma iron or non-transferring bound iron. We can find it inside the cells as LCI, labile cell iron, and inside the tissues, in the skin, in the hair, in the joints, etc. And also, <clears throat> it's in the organs, in the heart, in the liver, in endocrines, in sensory organs, mainly due to the position of hemosiderin. This excess of iron is capable to cause reversible or permanent damage and death. And we can see very nicely here how through the first, even the first years of a child, how iron is aggregated in the organs, in the heart, in the pancreas, and in the liver. And the targets, the organ targets of iron overload and the, com the subsequent complications are a lot we can find the iron in the pituitary, and then we have retarded development and infertility in the thyroid with hypothyroidism, in the heart, in the liver, in the pancreas, and in the gonades. And of course, infertility is one of the most important uh, complications with iron overload, with a direct and indirect action on the ovaries. But what is, what is the time, what is the limit 
where we accept that we are doing things well and we are expecting to have a better life for our patients. So far, we have been used to, to think with the golden rule of 1,000. 1,000 uh, milligrams of uh, ferritin was enough to prevent heart failure, arrhythmia, diabetes, hypothyroidism, hypogonadism, and of course, improve survival. It mostly prevented heart failure, which was the first cause of death for these patients. But liver uh, iron overload is seen in the majority also of patients uh, without cardiac iron overload. And uh, in patients with normal cardiac iron levels, there is often evidence of significant iron overload, indicating that liver iron overload may occur first before it appears in the heart and is therefore a primary risk factor from transfusion dependent uh, thalassemic patients. Liver iron overload may occur first before any other uh, site of deposition and before of course the heart. And here we can see a circle how liver iron loading occurs. LIC is going up, most common because of inadequate iron chelation. And then cardiac iron loading occurs. Because of no iron chelation or poor compliance or interruption of treatment due to pregnancy. And it is important to, to stress that uh, mean LIC, when cardiac T2 star drops, that means worsens, of course, below 20 was 15.1 for, uh, for, for the liver, which means that the liver is a very, very um, potent, a very large uh, storage department. And it's only when overflow of iron overcomes the deposition capabilities of the, of the liver, then it is that cardiac iron loading starts. And on the other hand, liver iron clearing is first observed for the heart. And then slowly we can see the clearing in the liver. No matter what the treatment modality will be, the way is the reverse. And so when mean LIC for uh, cardiac T2 star above 20, when, when T2 star for the heart improves, then we also have already uh, a minimalization of the LIC to 2.6. And here we can see the parallel way, but the difference is that we first see iron clearing and then the liver clearing. So, which is the role of LPI in the iron toxicity? High concentration of, of, uh, of the iron and then LPI is leading to free reactive oxygen species and then it causes cellular death or fibrosis. We have been used to discuss about different, uh, different patterns of deposition. It's different in beta thalassemia, intermediate, where, no transfusions, where there are no transfusions, and it's different in beta thalassemia major. And we, we thought that it was a critical difference that made things uh, to happen in another way in each part in each cohort of patients. But looking after what labile cell iron means and what it does and what labile plasma iron really can do, we can say that uh, LCI, the, the cell iron, rises following prolonged exposure of cells to labile plasma iron or when faulty cell iron utilizing machineries lead to malfunction and then the, the, um, the iron is, uh, is, uh, is stored 
And then we have the production of the uh, reactive uh, oxygen species that are reacting with all the elements, the cellular elements, and producing uh, damages that uh, will lead to cell death or fibrosis if talking about the liver. And the limit is only for the LPI is 0 0.4. There's a difference in the mechanism of death. You are all, you are all familiar with, uh, uh, with a cellular death, but this, this death is something different. It's not apoptosis. It's not apoptosis. Apoptosis is the tone in Greek. It's not apoptosis. It's feroptosis. It's different. It is programmed cellular death depending on reactive oxygen species with characteristics with small mitochondria with a thick membrane and minimized or deleted folds ending to membrane rupture. And feroptosis is also responsible for a lot of pathological situations like neurological diseases, diabetes mellitus type 2, heart failure, liver failure, renal failure, sepsis, rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory diseases. So the summary of pathophysiology and complications of hemosiderosis due to uh, reactive oxygen uh, um, species, uh, if not infection or uh, neoplasia prevail, it's cell death and fibrosis. And on the route, we can see how the interference of this phenomenon is promoting the stellate cells activation that are responsible for fibrosis, or even worse, the P53, P53 mutations for the hepatocellular, for, for the uh, hepatocytes, and then it's the moment that hepatocellular carcinoma occurs. So the ideal action, the ideal uh, treatment should be that one that could keep LPI low in plasma throughout the day, throughout 24 hours. And it can be uh, achieved with any kind of treatment, depending on how, uh, how the patient will be uh, reliable and um, uh, coherent to our uh, to our instructions. And now comes another question. Another question. How can the heart be cleared of the iron appropriately fast in case of decompensated heart failure or regularly in chronic iron overload? We can see here that the real question is what is doing faster? And we can see that the spherioxamine alone is effective but rather slow. The spherioxamine and the feripron are really faster and they, they can offer the action, the rapid action we need to prevent cardiac death. And even the feripron alone can do this but less fast than uh, the combination with the spherioxamine and the feripron. This is important to decide because uh, things are really acute in the, the first hours or the first days of the treatment, but also it is important through the next steps, through the next months for a patient who is under cardiac failure due to iron deposition. And uh, then we must uh, be sure that uh, the treatment preference will, will offer us a monthly change of the T2 star heart in uh, appropriate rate. And the, uh, the, the, um, the task, of course, is to reverse heart failure and change the left ventricle ejection fraction to make it improve. And for this purpose, the feripron and desferoxamine seem to be the most effective agents for this. And this is the reason why the American Heart Association consensus for treatment of acute heart failure is saying keep patient alive to allow iron chelation to work, which means offer him anything 
that will control arrhythmia and administer aggressive iron chelation to eliminate free iron and treat dyspnea and arrhythmias but do not harm and correct ident identifiable causative or aggravating factors. And you must immediately start intravenous desferoxamine continuous with no interruption for seven days per week and agent transfer to experience center for continuous monitoring. But what is the most important thing is to introduce the ferriprone as soon as possible and avoid inotropes. And also to prevent arrhythmias. And doing the right thing with iron means that arrhythmians often, almost always, respond to the proper iron chelation. For the chronic phase of, cedar, of uh, cardiac aposiderosis, of cardiac chelation, the ferriprone is equivalent to the ferroxamine in stabilizing or reducing serum ferritin and cardiac T2 star in patients treated with the feriprone, the sferioxamine, or the feracidox are not, of course, the same, but you can gradually wait patiently after the acute phase is corrected to have the effect of the long-term long -term treatment. In this long-term aspect, the feriprone is more effective than the feroxamine, I'd rather say faster than the ferroxamine in removing excess cardiac iron, and also the ferrocerox is non-inferior to the ferroxamine in myocardial iron removal. And in this, in this picture, you can also see the, the rate of change of cardiac T to star according to severity of baseline cardiac iron load and chelation regimen prescribed. You can see clearly how the ferriprone with its fast intracellular action as a micromole can produce. So the other, the other question is which is the liver iron relationship and what is the timing of this? Because as my speech proceeds, probably you, you can understand that I have two things to, 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 to wonder about. One and one of these is of course time how fast things happen and how long I can wait to achieve my, my goals. And then we will discuss which these goals are. In thalassemia, the liver damage is a combination of dyserythropoiesis and transfusion, and of course, the fat disease, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic liver disease besides uh, infections, HBV and mostly HCV infection, uh, do harm the liver. And we have been, we had in mind all this year that since you have both infection and then the iron, then things, things will go double worse. And in our study in 2013, trying to uh, to describe liver disease in adult multi-transfused patients, we noticed that when mean age was compared among patients with different stages of, uh, of fibrosis, there was no statistically significant difference, which means that, that patients preserve a stable state of fibrosis through the years. And also, hemosiderosis seemed to increase in parallel with liver fibrosis, and the correlation between the stages of liver fibrosis and the grades of liver hemosiderosis revealed in the end no significant correlation in, 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 pure, uh, in pure Greek, I, I, I would say. Uh, no matter how much iron you had, since you had iron more than normal, things were almost the same. And there was no statistical significance on fibrosis among different grades of hemosiderosis. And we also noticed histologically this time that through paired biopsies, between paired biopsies, fibrosis developing rate was very slow, only 0.1 yearly, which means only one stage by HISAC score. 
that was not expected for patients that should be accelerating fast. And the truth is that after 15 years of, uh, uh, of uh, taking over this patient, looking after these patients, we have had not even one liver decompensation, no patient with ascites or hyperbilirubinemia, except for the case they had not looked after their hearts and we had heart failure. It seems that there is, the, there is this phenomenon of frozen fibrosis, no small or no progression, and no progression to cirrhosis by age. And we can see that continuously in the cohort of patients we follow all this year, and you must see that something is happening here. These patients, this cohort of our patients, were born in about uh, 70s, and then growing up, you can see here what the damage of both, probably both, uh, the iron and the hepatitis C produced, but then suddenly, in about 1955, things are going better. They stop progressing, they, in the age of 27 or 37, they do not obtain cirrhosis, they do not proceed to cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is, the cirrhosis curve is leveling fast. So, what has happened here? Have you heard of the new treatment of hepatitis C in 1955? No. Have you heard of any other antifibrotic agent introduced those years? No. What really happened then is that it was the first time of introducing desferioxamine for first time intramuscularly. Yes, but my doctor, all this year, all those years, we didn't see it. Not normal, not even lower ferritins. It was very difficult. Yes, but people started not to die because that little quantity of chelating agent produced a 24-hour effect of, uh, uh, of wiping out the LPI due to this route of administration, even those small quantities of chelator were efficient to prevent the damage of LPI, like a depot regime. So fibrosis was significantly correlated with age, with AST and ALT, with inflammation, but advanced fibrosis was present with even minimal hemosiderosis. No little iron is safe, is the message, independently of ferritin value or HCV history. And look here how beautifully you can see the inflammation going away. These are the transaminases going down when at the same time you still have very high levels of ferritin. No normal ferritin, no clear liver, only wiping out the dangerous and freely to move around to any compartment of the cells and the plasma, the LPI. And you can also see that in this excellent work by Donier, where you can see that deferacirox, although in few patients did not even lower the, the LIC, but it could produce <coughs> improving of fibrosis because it stopped inflammation, not getting off the load of iron, but prohibiting LPI action. And this action was enough in the, in the later phases and the constantly administrating, chelating, the proper chelating treatment in the late stages, seeing slowly a small, impro a small improvement of fibrosis. So to summary up all this history of uh, of progress in thalassemia, you can see that we have no other excuse for improvement than transfusion, things went better, chelation and transfusion and chelation, but the critical point is when first chelation was introduced 
in 1980s and see how far this beautiful effect of stabilizing fibrosis, of freezing fibrosis, has come. And now, which should be the target of the chelation treatment? If all these things are real and all these things are accepted, how can we reevaluate, redesign the new levels, the accepted levels of, uh, of iron overload? We have been used to considering the values sorry, of 1.2 to 3.7 as normal. It's not normal. It cannot be considered normal because it, it's okay, it's right for preventing cardiac decompensation, but in this study and a lot other studies circulating, we can see that although the cardiac danger is going down, the liver, the liver death is going up. So something is going wrong. Even we are achieving the best, as we think today, chelating levels, we do not have in the end the best result, and the death is liver carcinoma, which is a very, very new and different agent, a different enemy. But this does not happen to patients with sickle cell anemia, where their first uh, cause of death remains Liver, uh, liver cirrhosis and decompensation, probably due to uh, micro obstructions, uh, vascular obstructions due to the, nat to the different nature of their disease. So we can see hepatocellular carcinoma going up, but it's not the first time we see that. Uh, in 2004, we, the, the first release of the Italian registry shows how the hepatocellular carcinoma is rising rapidly with a very small survival and uh, also uh, pointing out that 69 of the patients uh, had HCV RNA infection by then but also one in three patients had a history of hepatitis B and three patients had chronic hepatitis B this is to, to keep in mind, to bear in mind, as we proceed to new, uh, to new studies and uh, new elements uh, for these patients. And this is one of our studies where we conclude that the common characteristics of them were multi multifocality with a metachronous tumor development, like a popcorn effect. It was presented in uh, the ASLD conference last November, with a rapid expansion and great, great atypia of imaging features and poor survival of 12 months, and stressing, of course, the need for early detection. And also, one in three of these patients were without cirrhosis. It, it makes us think how hepatocellular carcinoma is presenting in patients with, um, with hemochromatosis or patients with thalassemia intermedia with, with no transfusions. And it makes us think also how deep differences are there between the multitransfused patients, excuse me, and the, the homogeneous heterochromatosis patients and the heterozygous hemochromatosis patients. And please, please, please look here uh, to a detail that is very important. Even when you think that you have obtained best chelation levels for your patients, you have only made them similar to patients with heterozygous hemochromatosis that you do know well that are prone to develop hepatocellular carcinoma without having cirrhosis. So the best of ours is the worst of another class of patients because iron is underneath all these uh, situations. So there's, there's no importance, there's nothing to, to discuss of where really iron is deposited, parenchymal or macrophagic. 
because even in thalassemia intermedia, there are studies, older studies than this, from 2010 and a few older, where we can see that even patients not transfused can have hepatocellular carcinoma. So, this Berdukas and Calisteni Pharmaki, two of our uh, uh, partners in all this uh, trip, are asking, should we reconsider the definition of efficient aposiderosis? Should we reconsider maybe ferritin level of 100 and LIC less than one, but when? Because we have now patients have, that have roasted their livers for 30 to 40 years with iron. If we do try to achieve these levels of aposiderosis, it will be effective for one generation ahead and probably will not have to confer a lot of things for patients now. So, is there now for you a true treatment dilemma between the liver and the heart? Actually, I believe there's no true chelation treatment dilemma between the liver and the heart because cardiac iron load and subsequent heart disease defines the priority, the intensity and the treatment of choice in acute cardiac failure as intracellular LPI is the direct and most urgent target of chelation. And liver iron content defines mainly the iron burden and predicts the duration and an effective chelation treatment. The ferripron in combination, the spheroxamine is more effective and the treatment of choice as well as combination treatment or monotherapy in cardiac iron overload, particularly in the acute phase but in consideration of the hepatocellular carcinoma epidemic, the task should be the total body iron overload removal. So in conclusion, the liver is loaded first and the liver iron overload may occur before it appears in the heart. The role of NTBI LPI is crucial for both the heart and the liver. The heart consists a priority when the compensated heart failure is present and the ferripron in combination with the spheroxamine is the recommended choice. The liver iron relationship has turned, unfortunately, I would rather say, into iron malignancy correlation. And in consideration of the hepatocellular carcinoma epidemic, the ultimate, ultimate task should be the total body iron removal, but in time, not too late. So, do you still wonder? Liver vice the heart? No. The heart, the heart first, but deliver always. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Contouras. Um,